Oh man, it's time to do another Q&A video. Oh, hello there. Would you like to do another Q&A video? I know I would. I got some great questions today. You ready for this? All right, so here's one of the first questions I saw that I thought was really, really helpful. Do you have to have W-2s to do an FHA loan? The short answer is no, unless you get w 2 So if you get W-2s, we're still going to need to see them, but it's not something where you have to be a W-2 borrower, which means you have to have an hourly wage or you work for somebody to get an FHA loan. You can still be self-employed. The tricky part with being self-employed is they will take your income after your expenses. So after you write off all the things you can write off as being self-employed that you may not be able to do as a W-2 person, then you uh, take that bottom number instead of the top number. And why that can be tricky is a lot of people that are self-employed, especially when they're first starting out, have a lot of expenses. Maybe they had to buy equipment or truck or, or clothes or hardware or tools or whatever they had to acquire to get the business started. They usually have a lot of write-offs for the first year. And many self-employed businesses don't make it past year two or three. So the guidelines are, are making up for that by saying you have to have a two-year tax return. So you have to be self-employed for two years and they take your taxable income. So the income after your expenses to factor your debt ratio. So a lot of times, especially the first of the year, I'm talking with a lot of self-employed borrowers and kind of reviewing what they're gonna file on their taxes and say, okay, based on what you're gonna file, this is how much you qualify for. If you wanna go back and adjust your expenses or just not claim as many expenses and just make your taxable income higher, then you will qualify for more loan. So it's just whether or not you want to pay more to Uncle Sam or more in interest rate or more in down payment to do programs that don't require uh, tax returns. So we do have programs that do that as well, but almost everybody's going to require a certain minimum time frame that you're self-employed before they'll start taking that income. So it does take a leap. Now, if you were a W-2 and then became 1099 or switched to an independent contractor, they can waive some of the time frame. So there's a lot of ways that people make their money. And there's a lot of guidelines that determine how we calculate that income. But there's so many laws and there's so many regulatory issues and constraints that we have in the mortgage industry that tie into what's called ability to repay or ATR. So as long as we can fit within those guidelines, there is some programs that work. But the less documentation you provide typically means a higher interest rate and very often means a much bigger down payment, where FHA loans only require a 3.5% down, depending on your credit score. They can require up to 10% down, but most of the time it's a 3.5% down payment. So it just comes down to what you've actually filed, how much you've written off, what your taxable income is, but you don't have to be a W-2 10 uh, hourly salary uh, employee. You can still be self-employed and get an FHA loan. Next question I saw here that I thought was pretty relevant to today. It has <clears throat> has to do with paying off your house when you retire. So there's a lot of points that I look at when I have a client that kind of asks me that question of whether they want to pay off a house or whether they should just maintain the payment. What I always say to people is, what other debts do you have first? You want to get rid of other things because that that dollar amount can go further on paying off maybe cars or other expenses than tying it all up on a home loan. Typically, the home loan interest rate is going to be lower than any other type of debt that you're going to have out there. So servicing that debt will be cheaper than servicing other types of debt. The next thing is how much money do you have behind that? Is it going to take everything you have to pay off the house? I don't recommend that because it's great to have all that equity, but you cannot get to it without selling or refinancing the home. And if you're at a stage where your income is going down or it's kind of locked in and fixed, you want to control your expenses as well. So having 100000 in the bank might be better than having 100000 in equity you can't get to without selling or refinancing the home. So I, I really look at the client's overall situation and see how much of a dent that will put in their security, how much dent that will put in their uh, you know, safety net, emergency funds. It's just better to do that. Because if you look at it, if the house payment's 1000 bucks a month and you got 100000 to pay it off, that's 100 months of making the payment before you run out of money usually your money will not run out before you do in that situation. So I think it's better to keep your cash flow as, as well as you can and keep money in reserve and get rid of anything else. 
So it's not just a yes or no answer about whether you should pay off your home in retirement because everybody retires differently. Like, is your income going down or up? Are you getting pension and social security? What other debts do you have? How much money is it going to take to pay off the house? Yeah, you get rid of that thousand, two thousand dollar payment, but if it ties up two hundred thousand dollars, how long can you make that payment before you run out of money? And while you're waiting to spend the money, you're earning interest on that, which right now over the next five to 10 years is probably a higher rate than you even have on your mortgage. With mortgage rates as low as they were, you may have a rate that's in the low fours, maybe threes. I just, I don't think that's the best use of the money. I really don't. But if you've got a million dollars in the bank and you've got your retirement, your pension, all your other debts gone, and it takes 200,000 to get rid of it, maybe, maybe that's when I would get rid of it. But honestly, it's like putting all your money in one stock or one gold bar or one silver or one commodity. Nobody tells you to do that. Why? So you can diversify. With a mortgage, it gives you that opportunity to leverage that money at a better interest rate and a fixed payment over the entire life of the loan. The only thing that will change is taxes and insurance, but that will change whether you own the house free or clear or not. So generally speaking, my answer to that is probably not. Mostly not. There's just better places to put the money. All right, next question we got. How does bad credit affect an FHA loan? It depends on what you mean by bad. It depends on, on where it affects the score. So obviously, if you have a bankruptcy, they're seasoning before you can buy another house with an FHA loan. So if it's bad because of bankruptcy, there's waiting periods. If it's bad because of a bunch of 30-day and 60-day and 90-day lates, it's probably affected your score to the point where you can't get an FHA loan. The FHA really likes to see so, so FHA doesn't loan the money. They set the guidelines that lenders follow that offers an insurance that protects the lender if you don't make your payment. So really FHA is like a mortgage insurance company more than anything else. So they insure the loan to the lender if they follow those guidelines. But lenders still have minimum requirements they want to see as well on top of what FHA requires. So FHA really doesn't have a credit score necessarily. They're more concerned with the history and why this score is kind of the way it is. But lenders will still have that overlay. They still want to see at least a 620 score is what I've seen. There are some lenders that go clear down to a 580 credit score, but they want to see a little more money down. So a lot of times when somebody has bad credit, that's usually what I say, let's work on that for, for two months, three months. Let's see if we can get the score back to where it needs to be. Maybe pay off some of the debt, maybe add some positive trade lines. There's a lot we can do to help you get the score that will help you get a better loan. It just takes a little bit of time. The problem I see with many people that have the bad credit, they put it off, put it off, put it off, and all of a sudden their lease expires and they got to get in the house by the end of the month or the end of next month, that kind of thing. And by that point, we don't have a lot of time to fix or get the credit as good as we possibly can. If you give yourself a little more time, you're going to get a better loan. So get started early. If you're in that situation where your lease is going to expire in the next 90, even six months, start working on the credit. It's the best way to get the best interest rate. And it might even free up to the point where you don't even have to put any money down if the score is high enough. So instead of saving up for the down payment, use that money to get the credit fixed and then qualify for different types of programs. Uh, how are we doing on time? I like to keep these to about 20 minutes or so. Oh, we are just flying today again. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, let's find another question here. Uh, what happens if your loan is too large to refinance? Well, you can't refinance. So most refinances don't go as high as a purchase loan or they still have some limitations on, on what type of refinance you're doing. So there's really two classifications of refinance. You have what's known as rate and term. This is where you're just taking the old loan amount plus the closing costs and you're just you're not getting any cash back. Anytime you get more than $2,000 back, it's considered a cash out refi. If you're consolidating, so you're not really getting the money in your pocket, but you're paying off a second mortgage or a car, a visa, student loan, whatever it is, those are considered cash out refis, which have bigger limitations on how much they will finance. So if your loan, if your loan, no matter if it's a car loan or a mortgage loan or anything, if it's bigger than what you qualify for, you won't be able to qualify for the refinance. That's one of the things that, you have to have either enough value in the home or enough value in the property to be able to, to have the loan to value to be under what you actually owe on the home. So if the loan's too big, you don't get the refi or you have to bring money in. You have to bring money to the table, almost like a down payment again to get the numbers to, to work. All right, let's see what else we got here. Let's go into mortgages. 
Let's see. <clears throat> How much can you owe on your home when getting an FHA loan in California? How much can you owe on your home when getting an FHA loan in California? So FHA does have loan limits. So they only go to a certain percent or not percentage. Sorry. They only go, they go to a certain percentage of the value, but they also have restrictions on how much they will actually loan. And every county state has limitations. Some areas are considered high cost. A lot of California has a higher loan limit than say here in Utah or Nevada or Kentucky or some of the other places around the country. So there is loan limits that once you hit that, even if you're 10% loan to value, even if the home's worth 50% more than that loan, that's all they'll do. So they do have restrictions on how much they will loan based on the loan limit, loan to value, and debt ratio. So those are the things that will determine the max that you will run into. But it's not like you can you can have a, uh, like I said, 50% loan to value and they'll loan anything you want. They do have restrictions on how much they will loan. And you can Google that. You can, you, you can do FHA loan limits and it'll give you their websites on the HUD website that will be able to show you, uh, you can pick the state, then the county, it'll show you how much that loan limit is. If it's a duplex, triplex, or a fourplex, the loan amount does go up. So if there's something where it's a multifamily, but you're living in the home, like living in unit A and you're renting out unit B, that loan uh, limit does go up on mul uh, higher density homes. But it is something where it still has to be a primary residence. They don't do investment home financing. Now, it doesn't mean you can't turn it into an investment home. So you live in the duplex or live in the single family for a year and decide to turn it into a rental, you don't have to refinance it to, to get out of the FHA loan. You just can't do an FHA loan to purchase as an investment property. So that's kind of a couple different rabbit holes with that question, but I hope that helps. All right, let's go. Da, 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 da. I want to go into mortgages here, find another question. How are we doing on time? I hope everybody enjoys these. I really enjoy doing them. I just like being able to answer the questions. A lot of times I don't prep a lot of these. Maybe I do the first one I looked at, but a lot of times I just try to find the answers and, and help you out. Uh, how can you get an FHA mortgage without having a down payment? So just an FHA loan requires 3.5% down, but FHA has a lot of programs that, that piggyback with FHA. So like in Utah, <clears throat> there's a Utah housing loan that does a second mortgage to cover the down payment and the closing costs. It's a great 100% option. So FHA doesn't have anything that goes above that 3.5% down, but you can come up with the money in other ways for an FHA loan. And there's other 100% financing programs out there that, don't, that aren't FHA. You also have uh, down payment assistance programs that can help with the difference. But just an FHA loan requires that 3.5% down from somewhere that's approved. They do have approved process. You can't just come up with it anywhere like the seller. The seller can't just gift you the down payment. Now they can credit your closing costs. So they can cover the cost of getting the loan or buying down the interest rate or covering the appraisal. So they can help you with the cost of getting it, but not with the down payment. Let's see. Can we refinance our home if we have outstanding judgments against us? The short answer is yes. It does depend on how that affected your credit score. So if your credit score, because of the judgment has gone down, it may affect your rates and terms. You also will have to have enough equity in the home to pay off the existing loan, pay off the judgments, and still be under a certain loan to value. So if you owe 90% of what the home is worth or 95% of the home is worth, there's not any money left over to cover fees and to cover those judgments. Typically, you have to be under 80% loan to value on the total loan that you need. So the payoff on the first, closing costs, pay off the judgment, all needs to be under 80% of what the home is worth. FHA does allow for cash out refis up to 85%, but you're only gaining that 5% and adding back in mortgage insurance on top of the interest rate. So that extra 5% usually isn't worth it. It just costs so much more for that 5%. Most people just, it's not worth it. So short answer, you wanna be under 80%, the next tier is 75%. The lower you are on that tier, the better the interest rates are going to be. But the short answer is, can you refinance a home with a judgment? Yes, if it doesn't totally trash your credit score and you have enough equity to roll that in. Uh, let's see. What is the maximum amount you should pay for your mortgage? Uh, let's see, that could be, let's see if there's a clarification on that. Maybe sometimes there's a little backstory on, you know, giving a little more information about it, but 
Uh, nope. Just says, what is the maximum amount you should pay for your mortgage? So I don't know if that means the closing costs, like how much you should pay to get a mortgage or how much you should pay as far as a monthly payment. So as far as a monthly payment, there's a debt ratio that is a maximum that you can get qualified for. So there is a number that's the maximum. And for my clients, sometimes that maximum is very comfortable because they have a lot of money left over. You know, maybe that 45% debt ratio, they still got 10 grand left over every month. So it's not as big of a hit. But if you're making two grand a month and half of your mortgage or half of your income is going towards that, that's not a lot left over. So there's always a balance act when I talk with my clients about what you can qualify for versus what's comfortable with your budget. There is a difference. So that's part of that. What's the maximum? It's based on your debt ratio. The next is what should you pay for a mortgage? It all comes down to how long you're planning on keeping the home. Buy downs are really popular right now to help people get the lower rates that we saw just a, a year ago, 18 months ago. So people have really been looking into these buy down options. But I always ask them, how long do you plan on keeping the home? If you're paying an extra two or three thousand dollars to get the loan to buy down that interest rate, how long do you have to keep the loan to break even? If it only lowers your payment 50 bucks but costs you three thousand dollars to get it, where's that break even point? You know, how long do you have to keep the loan before you even make up for that extra buy down? And if rates do get better in two or three years and you can refinance, then you kind of wasted that money on the buy down. What I honestly say is the mortgage insurance or there's some other places we can put the money that goes further for the same dollar amount. So that's why I like to sit down with clients and say, okay, yeah, buy downs are great, but might be some other places we can put the money based on how long you plan on keeping the home. And I'll say this, most first time homes aren't the last time homes. They're usually a home that people will stay in maybe three to seven years at the most. In fact, I would say maybe even less than that. Lately, people have been staying in the longer because the rates they have are so much lower but it is something where it's not usually the end home. It's usually maybe a starter home, a little smaller, maybe doesn't have the bedroom count. Maybe you want to move into a different school district or have kids or get married. There's things that can kind of happen where that home turns into a rental or you cash it out and move into another house. So you want to, you really want to look at the numbers on a mortgage on how long is the break even point? You know, how long do we have to keep the home? Almost every number I've run, it's between three to five years. Depend on based on how much it costs to get the loan. So if you know if you know it's not going to be that long, then don't do the buy downs. Don't pay the extra money. If you really know this home is indefinite, like you really have no plans to move till the kids are out of school, and that'll be 10, 15 years, you know, that that this house will fit your needs. That's where the buy down and paying points seems to make more sense. All right, we're at 17 minutes. All right. Let's see if we can get well, almost 18 minutes. Let's see if we can get one more good one in here. Where's a goodie? If you have any questions, comments, concerns, please post them. I'll get those in a, a future video. But I really like what I do for a living. I really enjoy helping people with mortgage loans. I've been doing them since 1999 here in Utah. I'm in southern Utah, St. George, Utah, the southern part of the state. I also do loans in Nevada. It's a bordering state, so we also do loans in Nevada. So I'd love to, to help you with that. I've done first mortgages, refinances. I've done cash out refis, remodel, home equity lines of credit. I've done it all. I've really done it all. So I'd love to help you with that. Let's see if we can find one more question. Let's see. Da, 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 da. Can I buy a house while in Chapter 13 bankruptcy? Believe it or not, yes. FHA alone, do, FHA does allow that if you get approval from the trustee and you can get out of the bankruptcy as part of the transaction. So buying is definitely trickier because of the money it takes to put the down payment down. But you can, believe it or not, refinance while you're in a Chapter 13. It goes off the file date, not the discharge date, as long as you haven't missed any payments. So a Chapter 13 is where you make scheduled payments. You kind of consolidate everything with the judge and the courts and come up with a dollar amount. Then you make a scheduled payment for a certain amount of time. So as long as you've made those payments on time and you've gotten at least two years worth of payments and the court approves it, yes, you can buy or refinance a home while in a bankruptcy using an FHA loan. I've done many of these. And most people don't realize that once you're to a certain point with a bankruptcy, as long as there's equity in the home, and there, there's some caveats with it, but it's an incredible loan. It's an incredible loan to get people to get out of the bankruptcy, start over, and uh, be able to have kind of a fresh start and still maintain the home. It's much more common for a refinance than it is for a purchase. All right, let's see. Oh, man, one more, one more. We can get one more. All right, let's see. Uh, what is a loan to own a home? 
Most commonly, it's called a mortgage. Mort means death or slow death. Gidge is contract. So it's a slow death contract. That's kind of a joke in the mortgage industry that a mortgage is a slow death contract. So it is something where it, it just takes a long time. It's usually a longer style loan. So what is a loan to get a home loan? It's a mortgage. It's also known as a home loan, but really most commonly it's called a mortgage. And depending on your qualifications will determine the mortgage that you get against the home. All right, one more. I'm having too much fun. How do you get an FHA or Federal Housing Administration loan with an existing mortgage? It just has to be a big enough loan to pay it off. So if you're trying to refinance into an FHA loan, the balance on the loan has to be low enough to where an FHA loan can replace it. But I will tell you this, not often do you have somebody going from a conventional loan or some other type of loan going into an FHA loan because FHA is a little bit more common to help purchase the property they do have what's called a streamline where you can streamline refinance if rates lower based on the original approval you have. So they do have some neat little features when it comes to refinancing if rates do drop. But it's not very common that you see people go from another loan to an FHA loan. Usually it's FHA loan out. And the reason being is once you have enough equity, you don't need the mortgage insurance anymore that FHA requires. FHA requires the mortgage insurance regardless of the loan to value. So typically, if you put 20% down, you don't have to have that insurance coverage. With FHA, you have to have it no matter what. So it is something where, and, and it doesn't go away unless you put more money down, then it goes away after 10 years. So if you don't put down the 10% or have 10% equity, you have to keep the mortgage insurance regardless of the value of the home for 10 years. If it's less than 10% down, you have to keep it for the entire life of the loan. So it's not very common you see people go from a situation where they either have cheaper mortgage insurance or no mortgage insurance to a loan that requires it. It's much more common the other direction. Uh, let's see if home insurance is home insurance required. If your mortgage is still paid off, technically, no, you don't have to have mortgage or home insurance. If the home is paid off, just like you don't have to have full coverage on your car, but you would want it. it it's such a cheap insurance there's no reason to get rid of home insurance. Plus home insurance covers liability, fire, theft, damage. Don't not have mortgage insurance. <laughs> it's something where, yeah, you may not need it because the mortgage doesn't require, but he, here's the other thing. Just like with car insurance, lenders have requirements that aren't really what you want. You want more coverage than what's really required because of the, the they just want to make sure their loan amounts cover the home gets rebuilt their asset you know the money they've invested into the property if it were to burn down gets rebuilt but your homeowner's insurance policy also covers liability so if somebody trips and falls and tries to sue you you've got at least some sort of protection that's in part of your homeowner's insurance so and it's not that expensive i mean th there might be some areas with high maybe flood or hurricanes or maybe you've got some issues with um fire areas, you know, high fire areas where maybe it's a little bit more expensive. Maybe you can adjust your coverage a little bit when you don't have the mortgage, but don't have, don't not have more home insurance. Don't not have home insurance. You want to have homeowner insurance because it is something where it has a lot more protection than just rebuilding the home. So that would be my answer to that. So looks like we are out of time. Back to sipping my beverage. Anyway, <laughs> so I hope you enjoy these. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, please post them. Please like and share. Let me know if there's any questions you have about the mortgage industry. I lend in the state of Utah and Nevada. So if you're looking to buy or refinance, I'd love to earn your business. Love to show you some options. But even if you don't use me, I love to answer these questions. I love to help. I'm at a point in my career where I really like the, the helping and, and just giving back to this industry by being able to help wherever I can. Now, I may not know exactly every single state law and what it requires, but I'll at least be able to point you in the right direction or help you with any questions you might have. I do a lot with helping people with credit. I would say that's one of the things I do probably more than anything is help people with credit and budgets to help them become a homeowner or be able to get out of debt with refinancing and stuff like that as well. But I really like that part of the business. I like the problem solving. I like the the nervousness of somebody going through this experience because it's a lot of stuff. It's a lot of paperwork and guidelines and worry about saying no and pulling your credit. And I mean, all those types of things really play into this. And I really like explaining it. I really like explaining the why behind we have all these guidelines and regulations and love to help you. So if you need help with a home loan in Utah, Nevada, I can help you there. But if you have any questions about home loan, mortgages, real estate, 
real estate investing, any of that, I'd love to help you out. Hope you have a wonderful day.